Okay. So our final speaker of today is Eli Rotenberg. He's going to give us a history of Beamline, work at Beamline 7. Okay. Uh, it's interesting the previous highlight talks have all been um, focusing on inhomogeneous materials and a lot of interesting uh, work on in situ uh, analysis, but that's far from uh, the, the fo how the photo motion technique was when I first arrived. Can everyone hear me, hear me when my head is up? Yeah. How's that? Is it better? I'll just hold it. <laughs> or I'll bring it down. Okay, how's that? Uh, so it's a lot different from how things are in photo mission, or at least how it was when I arrived. So to answer any first question, yes, it has been 19 years. The ALS started in 94, but I got here in 93, and right away we set up a laboratory uh, x-ray source for measurements. And this is the technique that we came to do. Uh, I was a postdoc then for Steve Kavan, and my colleague was Jonathan Denninger, who was then a postdoc for Brian Tanner. Okay. And uh, was part of a larger group at the beamline. The technique was photomission, x rays in, electrons out. We have this hemispherical detector. What distinguished uh, today's detectors from this one is in those days, we could only detect electrons on a narrow pencil beam. And if you wanted to get all of the angular, uh, information of the electron uh, density coming out of the sample, you had to rotate the crystal completely to get all the data. This is what we looked like in those days. Hard to believe. And this is the whoops, this is the technique I, I wanted to do. Uh, it was called photoelectron holography. The to look at the emission from one atom in a material and how that emission would interfere with scattered electron beams from neighboring atoms. And there was an influential paper in those days by Lou Terminello. Uh, you're looking at the emission uh, pattern of electrons from a copper 001 crystal, and if you change a photon energy, you change the wavelength of the electron. So these interference patterns change quite a bit. And you could reconstruct these uh, patterns to get uh, pictures of atoms in principle. So you wish that the picture would look like this. This is just a model. And instead you get these uh, sausages. And if you take a cut, you get this picture. And it's not bad, but uh, the promise in those days was that if you took enough data and if you judiciously ignored the bad data, which was not clear yet what it was, you could improve these. So that's what I was setting out to do. And I looked at the same uh, system. Uh, we built a system that could take this data very quickly, very efficiently. And even though, and, and here's various slices of a data set for copper. I, I didn't look at these in 20 years because we never published this. Really nothing came much out of this. But something very important came, and it's a lesson that if you spend a couple of years doing something that doesn't work out, you usually get something valuable. And what we got was a very reliable instrumentation for probing a momentum space of electrons. Uh, namely, it had high throughput. It was fully automated. The end station and the beamline, all the software integrated these two. So it, it came together as a very nice instrument. Um, also, and this was not a driving force for this measurement, but uh, for other needs of the beamline, we had a very small spot size, which by today's standard is not great, but was a new feature of the great new third generation light source. So not only could you do some kind of microscopy, which did become later, uh, later very important for me, uh, it gave us very excellent momentum resolution because the electron detectors like to have a small spot size. The only uh, flaw at the time, I would say, for what came later was that the beamline didn't have very good energy resolution, although it was okay for its time and extremely well suited for this measurement. Um, here's another system I was looking at is a tungsten 110 surface. And if you look at the core level spectrum, unlike copper, you can clearly distinguish uh, emission from bulk atoms and surface atoms. So there was the idea that we, we could do um, chemically resolved holography and look at just the atomic structure around the surface, maybe uh, consider the bulk separately. And this actually resulted in a paper, and it was the only paper on this technique that came out of the beamline. It was uh, pushed through by Chuck Fadley and his team. 
And this is the quality of the uh, atomic reconstruction that we could get. But you'll notice we start these projects around 94, and the paper doesn't really come out till 99. Because A, the data was sitting around for a little bit, but B, it was a huge numerical analysis project to, to get to this point. So that was not my vision of what was going to happen. I thought we were going to put in a material, take the data in a few hours, build up this hologram in real time, stop the measurement, bring the next sample, and it wasn't going to be like that. But somebody around that time, when we were looking at copper, said, well, why don't you put your detector window instead of on the core level, why don't you put it on the valence bed? I think you'll get some pretty pictures. So that was easy enough to do. And these are the first Fermi surfaces that we took on our beamline on copper. And they're not great. We didn't sample momentum space in a very fine way. But something was really good here. First, that we were taking this data very quickly. And if you look at competing papers that were published at the time, like Osterwalder and so on, they were taking pictures like this in 24 hours using a laboratory source. Is it better? I'm sorry. I'm terrible with these things, as you can tell. Uh, but it was also interesting because, from my point of view, I didn't have a background in this field. It was just so striking how sharp the pictures were and how full of information they were. And I went and cranked on the, the knobs and took lots and lots of this data, and I assembled it into a very large volume data set that uh, was mapped into momentum space that you could slice. And I looked at these horizontal planes, and lo and behold, were these beautiful circular features. And we're not imaging atoms here. We're imaging in reciprocal space. We're imaging the electronic states. So what I learned was that, oh, and the interpretation is like this. The atoms are like, arranged like this. In reciprocal space, we have these uh, zones, Brillouin zones. And in each zone, there is a spherical uh, constant energy surface. And that's what we're sampling. And it works not just for uh, copper. Yeah, so here's the, here's the message. I can take this data in a day and get these nice pictures. I learned something very valuable for me. Fermi services are easy to image. Atoms are hard to image. So we switched to Fermi services. And it worked not just for copper. We started to look. We, well, we now had a nice hammer. We started looking for nails to hit. And I started to look for materials that people hadn't looked at with the technique. And one of them was uh, quasi-crystals. And we got a very similar uh, data set here. You see these circular features. And this one, what we're doing is c cutting through these constant energy uh, surfaces. And at one stroke, this paper did a lot of things for me. It got me hired at the ALS, for one thing. That was a good thing. Uh, actually, I think this, yeah, that's right. Um, it also did a, did a lot of interesting uh, things for, for this uh, field because whether there were freely propagating waves in the solid or not was an open question. I, I think this data clearly resolved. And a couple surprises came out of this that I'll share with you. Um, one was I won a poster session prize at a meeting, and they gave me this lovely tenfold uh, symmetric teapot for the effort. <laughs> I guess here you'd have to give a bong or something. OK. And the other one was at the end of the year, uh, I don't know how somebody in LBL got a hold of this, um, this data I just showed you. Yeah. We, we colored it in, and it was made into a Christmas ornament. And this was the LBNL official Christmas card of that year. <laughs> a s second thing came completely out of the blue, and um, Ben Feinberg sent me this a few years later, was the 75th anniversary of LBL. And you can read that for yourself. But the US Senate had a, a resolution um, applauding LBL. And then each paragraph here was uh, something nice to say about each division. So what did they say about the ALS? 
Oh, I'm sorry, it's fuzzy. I'll read it. Uh, whereas the ALS is a national user facility that generates intense light for scientific and technological research, that, among other accomplishments, well, you love this language, has helped reveal how bacteria resist, what the heck does that say? <laughs> Antibiotics. I can't read it from here. How inexpensive and efficient solar cells can be fabricated and how unique substances like quasi-crystals possess properties never before seen by humans. <laughs> and, and there you have it, the three pillars of research at the ALS, biology, energy, and quasi-crystals. <laughs> now, going back in time a little bit, uh, resetting the clock before the quasi-crystal work, uh, we had the tungsten crystals because we were doing holography on tungsten, so I put the tungsten crystal into the Fermi surface measuring machine and I got this uh, data set. And, you know, you have to imagine, I've been a postdoc, I've been slaving away for a couple of years, and I really haven't had much contact with my boss, who was Steve. Uh, you know, I'd send him emails and pictures of atoms and so on, and I wasn't getting a lot of response, but I emailed him this picture, and he telephoned me for the first time in <laughs> two years. He telephoned me and said he put it on his door. And I knew yes, I am now doing the right thing. And the right thing uh, in this case was to go on and modify this surface by putting hydrogen on top of it. I'm not going to give Steve too hard a time about this, but he had done this uh, in, in uh, NSLS in the time of his postdoc. And I was telling him uh, by email or the phone that I was taking movies of these things, and he said, what what would movies be good for? And I said, well, they just look really cool and you really can tell what's happening. And this is the movie I was talking about. It's a cut of this uh, thing uh, through here, that line as a function of hydrogen coverage. And you could really see how the electronic states rearrange in the system. And I remember when he came down and looked at it, he started laughing. I think he was giddy <laughs> over this. And we went on and, and milked this uh, tungsten cow for all it was worth because this electronic structure was the first example of Rashba splitting in a very complicated metal as we proposed. Uh, we had a paper, while there was skepticism, we had a paper to try to prove by comparing the states on tungsten to the states on moly. Here I'm uh, putting lithium instead of uh, hydrogen, but there's a very similar thing happening, a sp splitting of the surfaces that's absent. And that's indirect proof, but maybe it wasn't that convincing. We had the worst referee comment I'd ever gotten <laughs> about this. But here's another lesson. You can overcome even that. <laughs> and I want to say I didn't get this particular referee again until last year because I got exactly the same comment again, and we're still struggling on a different paper to get it in. <laughs> but... This turned out to be true, and in a collaboration with uh, Jim Tobin, he had an end station on the beamline for spin result photoemission. We could clearly see the uh, in-plane spin polarization was exactly what we said. Uh, I think the last example of tungsten, we were chasing the idea that if you had many body interactions, then near the Fermi level, the bands would be distorted in some way uh, one thing you might expect is the uh, charge carriers to get heavier. And we were scooped by, I think, Alexis on this paper, a uh, work done in Brookhaven the previous year, who looked at a molybdenum surface and saw this effect better than this data looks. So we said, let's look at adsorbates. Maybe there's something different when you put adsorbates down. And we saw quite a larger effect in a, in a way. Uh, and then I showed this to Steve, and he said something I wish I had thought of immediately. He said, put deuterium on it, because you would get an isotope, a shift, how much renormalization you see here, which is this weird thing I'm showing, uh, and the energy scale that it happens will have to reduce by a square root of two. That's the mass ratio of these two. And lo and behold, we could e go back and forth on the same crystal, between a clean system and these two and, and uh, verify that. 
and that ended up being the first proof that these kinks are indeed due to electron phonon coupling because we had done this isotope shift. Now, uh, around the same time, another ingredient came into the system, which was the advent of fairly difficult sample preparations. And this was instigated by Professor Chu, who's a user, who wanted to be able to grow materials with such a structure. Now, these are samples about a centimeter or so in size. And if you do that, you confine the electrons in various parts of the structure. And this confinement shows up in the valence band by seeing these ripples when you change the thickness of the structure. And the way to change the thickness systematically is to grow these things with wedge profiles. And this was a really uh, good thing, not just because we, we got a nice paper out of it, but because it really uh, justified and helped enhance the sample preparation. Now, this was another referee uh, <laughs> comment. And we had, one, we had one really positive comment, and then this guy. Obviously, the referee was not to be counted among this number. <laughs> and also, the author list had 10 people, and we kept wondering who the other two were. <laughs> but, uh, but God bless him, Neville fixed this by completely rewriting the paper in a kind of personal coup over the rest of us because he removed all technical detail and made it really, and, and, and Britishized the language, so it sounded uh, appealing to the uh, British Journal. And it got in. And uh, anyway, the point is that we could map out the standing waves in a kind of direct way by probing this uh, quantum well states with a single monolayer of nickel that when he would disrupt the states, you would get a, a minimum intensity. So it was kind of like putting your finger on the vibrating string and feeling where the nodes were and deducing the waves. Okay. Now I want to talk about some more hardware developments. Uh, one thing that was very helpful was to build a manipulator that could not only cool samples, because till this time we we're measuring pretty much everything at room temperature, uh, and we aim to go to helium temperatures, but also could heat the samples very hot, which was necessary for the sample preparations. Uh, Karsten Horn, who was a collaborator on the quasi-crystal, I was chatting with him, and he had suggested a particular uh, arrangement of gears that could do not only this, but the, give us the motions we like. And I sat down in a CAD and passed off the CAD drawings to John Pepper, and John Pepper built it. And this was extremely successful. Here's a movie of what I mean, we were real, literally moving the sample, uh, could, could move it this fast and scan all of momentum space to get what um, The second one was, of course, ca coming in the late 90s, was the Sienta analyzers, which had the ability to collect a whole swath of angles time. So whereas we had to rotate the crystal point by point before, now we could get this whole picture. And uh, we went through two generations. The second generation is the Sinta 4000 that we have today. And this is the kind of results that we get absolutely routinely. Noise-free uh, data practically in just a few seconds. And you stack this up, and then you can slice and dice the data any way you want and get these uh, beautiful maps. As a result, uh, our throughput of data we can talk about paper productivity separately, but our data throughput uh, became very high. I'm plotting here how much data we take every month from the first month I started till today, or this, this month. And we come now to about 100, uh, up to 100 gigabytes or so per month. And you can see when there was a big uh, rise here th of three orders of magnitude, it wasn't when we got the Sienta analyzer, because there were still some struggles to use it, or even once, I would say at this point, it was working very well and reliably. It was when we got the goniometer commissioned that you could really scan at will everywhere you wanted. And then we had this huge rise in productivity. And I could see it coming. I looked up, when did I decide to stop calling the chamber X-ray photoelectron diffraction, which we really didn't do beyond this point here. <laughs> and I gave this a uh, name. ESF, Electronic Structure Factory, and I saw that it was right 
in the middle of this rise that I, I could see it coming. I even made a logo, which I never used. I had totally forgotten about this. I found it on my hard drive. Okay. So, uh, you know, everything I've shown you is really old stuff. I'm really not going to show you much new stuff. Um, basically, because many people have been here to yeah, I'm almost done. Many people have been here to see me or uh, Aaron or other people in my group give talks on this. But I'll just highlight two uh, that, were, uh, that, that were really enabled by these instrumentation improvements. One was the, the work on graphene, which uh, we started in 2005 when we got the second Sienta analyzer. And it started uh, really as a, a calibration tool. We were looking at graphite because the bands were very sharp. And it got us into graphene. And the point is that if you know anything about graphene, you surely know that it has this strange conical band structure. But in photomission, we don't measure bands per se. We measure excitations. And the excitation spectrum is predicted to look something more like this. And you see in our measurements not just this main quasi-particle band here, but also this shadow band. And this shadow band arises from the Coulomb interaction. It's electron-electron interaction in the material that makes a new quasi-particle called a plasmaron. And proof of the picture being true is to rescale this data in such a form, independent of the energy and momentum, and see that all the data lie on top of each other. This is a key property of the Coulomb interaction in, in uh, Dirac materials. Uh, what you're seeing changing in the movie is the doping. We're changing the doping in situ by putting atoms onto the graphene. And this led to two papers that were very nicely received and, and several other uh, were also explored. The second uh, instrumentation improvement was the ability to grow complex oxides started in 2008. And for example, I'm going to show you the Fermi surface of vanadium oxide grown in situ. And this is the K perpendicular uh, variation. It's the first time anyone could take this data because if you grow this crystal in the bulk and cleave it, you don't get a nice enough surface for photo emission. So coming to the end, uh, I want to say something about the publication record. And the best thing I could say about this number uh, is we urged the resist to publish too many papers. Um, but we did OK, almost 10 per year. Not bad. But very much so, uh, we focus on high profile publications, really hard projects that you can't do anywhere else. And then I think we did, we did very well. And why did I not update the numbers to include 2012? Because I have a plot here of the percentage of high, public, high impact publications per year. And if you include just the first two of 2011, they were both high profile. We, we hit 100%. If I show all the data, it would, it would plummet back down. And <laughs> that looks bad. Um, here is what the chamber looks like today. We have a, a photo emission, a sample trend, uh, motion, sample storage. We can store 70 samples all together in the system. Two uh, sample preparation chambers one for conventional materials and one for oxides. And uh, here's a laser. It drives the uh, growth of the oxides by using uh, laser pulses on targets. And it has this funny serpentine shape because if I drew the rest of the beam line, you'd see all this stuff here. And this is where we could fit this in. And we ran out of space because there's obstacles everywhere else. Uh, or else maybe we wouldn't have had more capabilities. And a highlight of this chamber was publication of its picture in this uh, journal. <laughs> okay. And don't ask me how it came about. But uh, here's, here it is. <laughs> and I know you guys laugh, but if you look at the readership of this journal, more... <laughs> More people have seen this chamber than have ever seen any of your papers. Probably combined. <laughs> okay, I have to wrap up because uh, Paul is next, and I'm probably coming over already. Uh, going back in time, we had a, 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 a scanning photo emission chamber. Uh, I was not so involved in the initial development, but the idea was to do submicron or nanometer scale photo emission. One paper came to work but not much. I was uh, kind of tooling around with this thing uh, in around 2000. 
And uh, somebody approached me, Vladik Velukovic in the uh, MSD, about looking at semiconductor alloys. And this data got a lot of attention because it showed we could get chemical and electronic information with decent resolution. So I had this idea around for uh, a few years, uh, but didn't do much because really it's still, the tools weren't quite, quite what people wanted. And the, the key event that came in was I started working with uh, Jerry LaPere, whose postdoc was Aaron Bostwick. Uh, Jerry got wind of the project and gave us a Sienta 200 to play with. And with that machine, we can get real RPs data. And this led to a successful proposal. Now, I found this nice cartoon. Uh, our dream of 18, or make it 19 years, has come true. But God knows what it does. <laughs> And this is the uh, equivalent. This is the design of the new beam line that we want to install to replace what we've been using. I, I, I wish we had gotten some copies of this journal. It's this month's article, but in the lobby you'll find last month. So unfortunately, you'll learn about RICs instead of uh, RPs. It combines the end station I've been showing you data from with a nano RPs end station and also a PEAM and a whole suite of sample preparation and characterization tools that are a great improvement over what we have. Uh, this is the nano RPs chamber. I'm not going to, to show it. Uh, I, I want to now conclude, and I'm going to say thanks to all the people who have contributed in some way to the, the information in the talk, but there are also many, many other contributors that I couldn't get to, wouldn't fit on the slide, and in my old state couldn't remember all. So I want to thank, if anyone is not on this list, that I'm very grateful for all the support I have had from the and from ALS management, from LBL uh, management, and from, from DOE, who've, who have uh, funded all of this. So here it is. This is the beam line this morning. It is locked, shutter closed, no more. And if you come in a month, this will all be cleared out. Uh, we had a party, very, very small party, on Friday. Here's the cake. Rest in peace, ESF. Hopefully, it'll be resurrected again. Uh, and this is the site where we'll build the new beam line. And the last message here uh, has to do with my fame of having the messiest beam in the world. Uh, this fellow had something to say in my fence very much. Thank you very much. Um, any questions before we head off to, to lunch? So who are the other two? You said you didn't know who they were. Yes. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> probably Ortega and him, so that's it. All right, so don't forget that workshops begin this afternoon. Um, you can find the locations in your, in your handouts.